All right, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Maggie Malin. I'm the Advocacy Manager at Active Trans, and welcome to our webinar on outreach strategies and petition writing. Uh, we, uh, we're going to have Greg Merrill speaking today, who's our Advocacy Director, as well as a special guest from McHenry County, Greg Glover. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Bike Walk Every Town is a suburban, our suburban advocacy training program, uh, and we we want to offer tools uh, to all of you to help you uh, improve biking and walking uh, in your community and become more effective advocates. So, just a little background about the Active Transportation Alliance. So, we are a nonprofit located in Chicago though we work in the entire Chicagoland region, and we advocate for walking, biking, and public transit to create healthy, sustainable, equitable communities. Uh, and thank you to our sponsors, REI and UIC, uh, who, who make this work possible for us. And now I want to introduce our speaker today, Jim Merrill. Uh, he's our advocacy director at the Active Transportation Alliance. And he previously worked for the AIDS Foundation of Chicago. He was their uh, national advocacy manager. Uh, and he has a bachelor's in political science and government from Northwestern University. So I will turn it over to him. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, thank you, Maggie, and uh, welcome everyone to uh, this outreach webinar, part of our ongoing series of advocacy skills building trainings. Um, and so today, uh, I'm going to be talking to uh, to to you guys about about outreach. And um, for people who have been kind of following along with Bike Walk Every Town, we've developed uh, a whole catalog of skills building tools and resources. So um, a lot of the stuff I'm going to be talking about, there's also kind of hard copy versions online. And as Maggie mentioned, this webinar is being recorded. So, you know, if you really want to relive the experience, um, you'll be able to do so. And also it'll be available for, for posterity through the ages, thanks to the, the internet. Um, a, couple of, uh, a couple of things that we're going to run through today. Um, you know, outreach, we think about outreach on a, a couple of different levels. One is, you know, finding your base or the, the grassroots level, so really connecting with, with everyday residents and people who can, can help you build grassroots power. Um, but also outreach dir directly with, with targets or decision makers. So when we talk about targets, we're talking about the people who have, uh, who have the power to give us what we want, whether we're looking to implement a complete streets policy or get an active transportation plan uh, passed or, um, have uh, have funding allocated to support those things. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some petition writing tips and best practices, knowing that petitions are, uh, you know, one of the uh, best ways both to engage targets and uh, build a base of supporters. And then we're going to have Greg um, from uh, McHenry County uh, share a recent story of some real-world advocacy uh, that he and others led around the Bull Valley Trail Gap and some success that they enjoyed in um, getting a really great response to a petition drive that they did. And then we'll have a few kind of resources to share with people uh, going from there. So I'm just going to jump right into it. Uh, so when we talk about, about finding your base, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more a little later on about, you know, trying to be more strategic in, in who we're targeting. But oftentimes, you know, we're starting, um, we're starting with our own personal networks when we're looking for individuals to join us in our advocacy work. And so once you, you know, if you've been using uh, the Bike Walk Every Town campaign action planning tool um, and you've already kind of determined kind of what your needs are in, in terms of policy changes or projects you'd like to get done locally um, and you've kind of thought through what you're trying to accomplish, um, as you start uh, moving into finding your base, really looking at your own network and talking to your neighbors and friends is one of the easiest ways to, um, to, to begin building your space. A lot of times people... Um, that we're already connected to, share our, our values and, and things that we're interested in accomplishing. Um, but also li looking beyond your own network, um, you know, even in smaller communities, there are often people or organizations that we're not personally connected to that might uh, 
might heed our call to join us in advocating for better walking and biking. And so one of the things that we always do um, when we're doing any kind of grassroots organizing is ask everyone that we talk to uh, who else they might know um, and asking for suggestions um, that can always help you uncover new people. So not just thinking about individuals as folks that you can get involved um, with them personally, but also reaching into their uh, personal or professional networks to find new people um, to add to your cause. And then, you know, once you find these individuals, um, being re ready with a way to act activate them, so in advance, so before you even have that first conversation, you know, thinking, um, thinking forward, you know, do I want to invite people to, uh, you know, a campaign planning meeting where I immediately have some, some way to invite them and activate them and not just kind of tell them about, about the problem, but um, uh, uh, give them a next step and help kind of build off of that momentum. So activating them around a petition, a meeting, um, you know, uh, signing them up for an e-newsletter, e getting their contact information, um, you know, or a combination of all three of these, these things is, is a great first step. Um, in addition to individuals, a lot of times, uh, you know, there are already existing organizations that have those network, those networks of engaged people, and and may have um, existing venues and meetings and and uh, groups of people that can be mobilized around your cause. And this is something that um, we at Active Trans, you know, when we're doing our our own campaign organizing, spend a lot of time. Um, a lot of time working on. A lot of times, communities are already organized. You don't need to go out and create a whole new organization. Um, but it's just really identifying where are the partnership opportunities, what are the groups where your uh, agenda item or your policy goals fit into what they're trying to accomplish. And a lot of times, you know, you can get if you can get your issue or priority on the goal of an influential organization, um, that's half the battle in terms of being of winning and being successful. So. You know, really just kind of thinking through where are the shared interests with organizations, um, which organizations could positively be impacted by your goal. Uh, you know, if you're looking at improving a trail um, in a in a forest preserve, is there a stewardship group that maybe is more interested in the ecological aspects of the forest preserve, but also have a stake in, in you know, finding ways to bring people to experience open space, that kind of thing. Um, and then, uh, and then find ways again. Likewise, always be thinking about not just identifying these folks, but how do we activate them? Um, you know, having them show support for your uh, campaign or issue by a flyer in their window or helping to distribute whatever literature you might have. Um, and again, tapping into their existing venues for conversation. Um, a lot of organizations have regular meetings. If you can get on that agenda. Um, you can have a whole room full of people that you don't need to worry about finding, um, that you can speak to all of them at once, and it really, you get kind of more, more bang for your buck uh, when you can identify partner organizations. So again, just kind of thinking about, um, you know, where to start looking. A lot of times, you know, we have a lot of people reaching out to us and who express, uh, you know, willingness and excitement about, about organizing, but they just don't know where to start. And so I think just kind of brainstorming really quickly um, about the people that you already know, uh, you know, so your fellow residents, neighbors, friends, uh, schools are great, you know, social networks. Um, so many people are connected to schools and often are highly motivated uh, individuals interested in, in improving quality of life in our communities. Um, any existing public events, um, you know, if, you're, if your community has a, has a festival or a big splashy event, um, finding a way to, to have a presence there. Um, and then who are the direct, you know, stakeholders for the, the, the project that you're trying to promote? You know, again, using the trail example, um, people who might be using that trail who would stand to benefit personally from any improvements, um, finding ways to, even if it's just standing out and, and setting up a, a tent with some, some cold water um, could be a great way to, to capture those people's attention. Um, again, organizations, parents groups, hiking clubs, bike clubs, uh, senior groups, um, chambers of commerce. Uh, a lot of times, you know, I think um, we narrow our thinking in terms of what types of organizations might be involved, particularly when we're, when we're talking about walking and, and biking. Um, but more and more we've seen uh, among local business communities and the chambers of commerce that often represent those local business communities, a growing awareness um, that the role that uh, positive uh, conditions for walking and biking play 
in creating robust local uh, retail environments. And so um, if you haven't already reached out to your local chamber of commerce or whatever the kind of business association or community hub might be, I think that's a great place to, to be looking for partnerships. It's also often, um, we're going to talk about this a little um, a little further in the presentation, you know, chambers of commerce and the business community often have uh, the ear of local elected officials. And if you can build strong partnerships uh, with people who can tell a story about uh, how your uh, walking and biking improvements can impact the local economy, um, that's often a winning and persuasive argument with the people who ultimately have the power to give you what you want. Likewise, uh, local hospitals or healthcare providers, healthcare organizations, um, you know, a lot of churches also have like health ministries and, and things like that. And any group that's kind of health related, when we're talking about walking and biking, again, there's an increased awareness among um, both, you know, the public health community and healthcare providers, insurers, uh, that uh, you know, making it easier for folks to walk and bike um, is a great way to uh, help disrupt the um, the kind of some of the, the structural issues that lead to people not being as physically active as they need to be, and uh, the different kind of chronic disease and and public health impacts that uh, that inactivity can lead to. So, oftentimes, um, you know, local hospitals have a lot of uh, prevention and wellness activities that are often very visible in the community. They also often have money <laughs> to give away uh, and resources um, that can be leveraged to help support your campaign. So again, kind of the business community and local hospitals, I, th I think, are really great places to be building partnerships if you haven't already done so. Um, and then finally, you know, businesses, individual businesses themselves, uh, Main Street shops, um, nonprofit organizations, any kind of public public library or, or other uh, cultural or, or civic organizations that you might have um, in, in your community. A lot of these places are, are destinations, and so when we talk about transportation, giving people easier access to these destinations, um, I'm, I'm always amazed at how quickly uh, a lot of small business owners in particular understand the benefit of, um, when I talk to them about bike lanes or improving sidewalks, uh, immediately make the connection to the benefit to their, their local business and their bottom line. Um, so a lot of folks uh, who are involved in, um, you know, building a, a local business are, are probably eager and they're just waiting for someone to ask them to, to join join their cause. So these are all good ideas for, to think about, um, places you can start to build relationships and, and organize folks. So I mentioned, you know, the importance of, um, you know, a lot of times it's good just to kind of start with, with who you have and, and find ways to, to connect with the people that you have immediately uh, available to you and people that you know. Um, that's great, and it's definitely something that you should, you should do. Take advantage of those, those close connections and the, the low-hanging fruit with, with your base building. But a useful activity um, to also go through when you think about how do you target individuals or organizations that you want to build relationships with and involve in your advocacy work is something that we call power mapping. And so if people have been involved in any kind of organizing or issue advocacy, this is a pretty um, familiar concept that uh, that organizers talk about in a lot of different ways. And again, um, kind of going back to our Bike Walk Every Town campaign action planning, at the end of the day, successful advocacy is directing um, you know, a clear uh, a clear goal um, at a, a specific decision maker who has the authority or the power or the influence to to give you what you want. So that might be your your local mayor, it might be your board of trustees, uh, it might be um, you know a planner, uh, a staff person at the at the city office. You know, depending on what you're trying to get done, the decision maker is going to be a different person. Um, but as we've talked about in other trainings, it's important to realize that um, to build your campaign around influencing specific human being decision makers with a name and a face and values um, and finding out who those people are. And then once you have identified that, that person, power mapping is really simply just thinking, uh, putting yourself in their shoes and thinking about who are the, um, who are the people that have influence or have the ear of that individual. And when we're talking about elected officials um, or, or staff people, uh, you know, a lot of times um, an easy place to start is their donors and supporters. Um, if they're an elected official, they often will have a political 
organization, either formal or informal, that is made up of, of people in the community that, that actively support them. So uncovering who those people are often are, you know, is a great place to start. Um, the Illinois Election Commission actually has um, a pretty easy to use website where you can actually look up um, who is donating to specific people's campaigns. So that's a that's a, a fun little. It can be fun. It can be <laughs> terrifying and sad, depending on <laughs> the context. Uh, but it's a great resource and a great tool to find out, you know, who's actually giving money to these um, elected officials, and you know, do you have a connection with them? And it's like, oh my God, it's Steve across the street. Um, I know, I know him, and I can, I know he's into this. So maybe he would come with me to a meeting with the decision maker. Um, but also, you know, their friends, their business associates family members, um, you know, what media um, is the decision maker reading? Um, is there a local news outlet that um, is important to to kind of affect, um, uh, you know, who, who do they listen to, who are their advisors? And then each of these, you know, kind of first order connections to decision maker, again, have their own networks. So even if you can't get to that one specific donor, um, do you know someone that they work with or, you know, do you go to church uh, with their cousin or, you know, do, do your kids play soccer together? Um, so kind of taking this exercise a couple of layers deep can help you identify folks that you might have more access to, and then you can build your campaign activities around um, engaging those people and then bringing them along with you, and it, it might make it a lot easier because sometimes, you know, one, one phone call from an influential person at the right time to the right decision maker and you can win your campaign in one fail swoop without having to do a whole lot of work. So this concept of power mapping is something that we think is, is really important, and certainly when you think about outreach and what people and organizations you want to connect with is something that you should definitely spend some time um, thinking about. So um, once we you know, identify uh, who our base is, what individuals and organizations are on board with what we're trying to accomplish, um, it's important, again, to find ways to engage them, um, both to help move the campaign forward, but also to, to build that sense of community um, and the interpersonal relationships that are really the glue to any type of organizing. You know, at the end of the day, um, uh, advocacy and organizing is all about interpersonal relationships, and so um, it's a lot easier to do that uh, when you're creating opportunities for people to get to know each other and to interact. Um, so very simply, just kind of organizing uh, regular meetings um, is, is a great way to, to bring people together, have have a clear agenda items um, and, and next steps, um, having them be a fun and social environment. Uh, we've been organizing a series of meetups for Bike Walk Every Town uh, participants just had one in the northwest suburbs on on Monday uh, in Itasca that was at a brewery and people had a great time and there's camaraderie um, but we also talked about ways that we can work together on our advocacy issues so it doesn't have to be uh, feel like work <laughs> to be getting work done um, but I think the important thing when it comes to holding meetings and people may have experienced this in their own you know, professional and personal lives is you know uh, successful meetings involve preparation, and so being clear on what you know, what kind of key questions or outcomes uh, you want to achieve at that meeting, um, and then having an agenda that will help you get there, um, and not being afraid to um, to you know, as the convener or the facilitator of the meeting, to kind of enforce that agenda gently. Hopefully, it's not confrontational. Um, but often, you know, people are excited and have a, lot of, a million other things that they can be talking about. And so as leaders, um, being prepared with strong agendas and being willing to facilitate meetings can help make, make them a lot uh, more productive. And then making sure there's a shared understanding when you walk out of the room on kind of what the next steps are. It's not just what actions are going to be taken, but who is going to be responsible for taking them and by what date and time will they be happening. Um, and again, you know, I think a lot of folks um, – may do this type of work planning and stuff in their own professional lives, but those skills definitely apply and are useful when it comes to um, our organizing lives as well. So another good way to uh, engage your base, both um, to find find people um, and to, to bring folks in and act activate them is, is just, you know, providing some, some collateral resources and materials that explain your, your campaign. Here's a, a picture of one of our Bike Walk Every Town flyers from our summits that we did um, last fall, um, 
So, you know, having those easy to understand informational resources, not only for you to share, but also so you can hand off to people who are in your network um, that they can then bring to, you know, the events that they're going to. And that way, you know, again, you can really start kind of working the network um, and having people reach into their own social networks, their own professional networks, and bring people into the fold. Um, it's really about kind of thinking through those kind of second or third order connections um, is where you really begin to build um, build a, your advocacy army. So things as simple as a, a fact sheet, um, a document that kind of lays out uh, the facts about a, a problem and, and what the issue at hand is as an educational resource, a flyer um, for a specific event or your meeting that you're organizing. Uh, if you have the capacity and the skills, um, producing a video is, is you know, another example, um, certainly a great online tool. Um, and then petitions, uh, where you're actually asking folks to endorse a specific p uh, position and, and lend their name to, to your, the, the ask or the action that you're seeking to achieve, um, can also be great educational tools, too. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit more about petition writing in a minute, but, um, you know, thinking about ways, often, you know, petitions might not win, the, carry the day in terms of being the thing that convinces um, the decision maker to give you what you want, but it's a great organizing tool to help um, connect with people, um, have them feel empowered, and to, to get their information so you can bring them into future advocacy opportunities. So again, you know, hosting uh, hosting events um, in addition to, to you know, um, more kind of campaign planning meetings that we were talking about earlier. Having pub fun public-facing community events are a great way to bring people into the fold. So um, again, always kind of having a goal in mind of, of what you're trying to achieve. Are you trying to um, identify new grassroots supporters that are going to join your campaign? Are you trying to um, attract media attention? Uh, do you want to get specific influential members of the community um, to uh, see a specific problem or issue? And at Active Trans, we've had a lot of great, um, a lot of great success putting on events that are that are interactive. And one of the nice things about working on on walking or, or biking issues is that the issues themselves are active, <laughs> uh, putting the active in, in active transportation. So oftentimes when we're talking about issues with infrastructure or roadways. Um, events that simply get people out to look at the problem and to experience it on, you know, a human level as a pedestrian or on a bike is a fantastic way to um, build support um, and to, to really kind of um, turn people onto your, your campaign. And this works really well with decision makers as well. I've, I've seen it happen in real time where you get a, an elected official out onto a roadway who maybe they've only ever driven through the intersection and they've never experienced firsthand what it's like to cross that street. Um, and then, you know, they have that experience of, of walking or riding a bike along a d dangerous se segment or through an intersection and all of a sudden the flip switches and they become um, you know, a, a walking and biking evangelist for your for your cause. So I can't kind of overstate the effectiveness that um, activities that actually get people out on the street or on the trail, whatever um, specific problem that you're trying to address. Uh, how they can really uh, work wonders in terms of building support, both among grassroots people and those decision makers that you're targeting. So things like group walks or uh, a walk audit, and a walk audit is just very simply. Uh, a more structured activity, and, and we have resources that we could share with you if you're interested in doing this. Um, you know, having getting out there with some clipboards and photos and a, a list of questions that can help you actually document what specific issues with a roadway might be, um, both for walking and biking. But getting out there on foot and actually documenting firsthand uh, is a great. It's a great way to get information and data that can help you make your case. But it's a great activity for organizing because it, it actually gives people um, a real first-hand experience and a concrete activity to take. So both for kind of grassroots supporters and for decision makers, uh, walk audits are a fabulous, a fabulous tool that not only gives you actual data um, on what some of the specific challenges are that you need to solve, um, but give, give people that really visceral experience of um, why it's so important that these issues be addressed. Um, you know, bike rides or um, bike rodeos, so little, little fun obstacle courses for, for the young ones. Uh, we just posted a blog on bike rodeos just this week, talking about uh, 
Chicago Heights, they've been doing a bike rodeo for 30 years, which is incredible to me. Um, but if you don't know what a bike rodeo is, you can go to our website and read about their experience doing that. Um, but again, these are, you know, fun events that people might do um, anyway, just because they're an enjoyable way to spend your time. Um, but there's, it's easy, there's an easy, easy way to integrate advocacy into these by having a petition there for folks to sign, by uh, having a group conversation after the bike ride, talking about what people saw, what challenges, or what they liked, what they didn't like. Um, and that can really uh, be really engaging to, to bring folks in to, um, into the fold for your, for your uh, campaign. Um, you're having a, a, a panel discussion, creating some kind of forum for um, experts or people with first-hand experience on the issue uh, to share their knowledge in a public setting and have a, a question and answer dialogue um, can often be an engaging topic depending on, you know, what type of community you live in and what your issue is. Um, you know, having a happy hour, as I mentioned, we just had our, our social event at, at a brewery in Itasca and um, that's really, you know, our, our goal there was was very much to, um, to do some community building and to, to make it fun and having those strong interpersonal relationships and people, you know, having positive feelings about spending time with you um, helps you build up that uh, that well of, of support and um, you know good interpersonal connections that you can then mobilize when the time comes around a specific advocacy ask like show up to this meeting um, a pop-up event uh, this is something else that we've got some resources on if, if you're interested in learning more um, so when we talk about pop-up events with walking and biking it's often we're talking about doing temporary roadway transformation projects to, to, to demonstrate, um, you know, what a bike lane might look like or how an improved crosswalk might look like. Uh, this is also often called tactical urbanism um, among, amongst the, uh, the walking and biking professionals in the world. We've got some videos on our website, and we can send these around if people reach out to us. Um, showing some recent pop-up events that we did. And again, similar to walk audits or bike rides, uh, this is a really great way to, in a very safe and temporary and non-committal way, kind of demonstrate, um, and often, you know, very low cost. Um, you can just, you know, use some paint and some cones and some flowers, you know, and spend, you know, 50 bucks and have a little temporary, um, temporary installation that can show the type of complete streets improvement that can really uh, transform a community. Um, so these pop-up events are something that we've had some experience with, with putting on and can, can coach you on how to do it. Obviously, you know, you need to, oftentimes you need to make sure you're working with the right folks in your community to make it make it happen. But um, again, really powerful in giving people that kind of first-hand experience. And often for, um, for folks in the community who might be concerned about the impact that changes to the roadway might have on their ability to drive, showing them that it's not the end of the world um, when you take a little bit of roadway space and give it over to people walking or, or biking, um, again, can, can go a long way in terms of um, building that support. And then again, I said, you know, as I, as I mentioned, um, don't just bring people together to bring them together. Always have a, an action that they can take, something that they can, they can do to get involved, whether it's signing a petition, um, whether it's helping to, you know, snap a photo and share it on, on social media with a, a link to something that people can sign up for. Um, giving them something to do um, so that they can be a part of your work and help you build your network is is really important part of having uh, not just a successful event, but a, an event that's going to drive your advocacy. So kind of changing gears um, to outreach that's more directly um, geared towards engaging your target. So again, the decision maker who has the ability to, to give you what you want um, whether it's a specific project you want done, a, a plan that you want developed, funding that you need allocated. Um, typically, you know, uh, decision makers um, respond to two types of input, so persuasive information, um, so, you know, data and facts and arguments that um, <coughs> help uh, help persuade them, tie into their own kind of interests um, on a given issue, and to help motivate them to, to take action. And then good old public pressure. So particularly among elected officials and particularly on the local level where oftentimes, you know, you're not talking about um, them serving a, a huge number of constituents. Uh, a few um, 
a few residents that are, get worked up about a particular issue can often um, get quite a response from elected officials who are eager to um, keep positive uh, relationships with, with their constituents who are, you know, at the end of the day, they're voters. Um, so public pressure can, can be through, uh, you know, uh, attending a meeting, to having a petition, but also not forgetting that media um, is also another great way to, to apply public pressure. So um, one of the ways that you can um, both, you know, be persuasive and apply pu public pressure is through uh, creating a, a petition. And a lot of times people ask us, you know, what's the formal process or what kind of language do I need to make my petition be official? Um, and sometimes with, you know, specific, if you're trying to engage in a specific uh, parliamentary procedure or, <laughs> or a plan or a certain commission that might have rules for how formal comment can be submitted, it's important to, to know what those are. Um, but you know, typically there's no, there's no, uh, there are no rules when it comes to how you write a petition, and especially when you're targeting an elected official, um, just a clear message and a, a, a list of names uh, is 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 really, you know, kind of the heart and soul. This is, it's really a way to kind of document um, that when you're talking to someone, there are other people standing behind you, even if uh, they're not there in the in the room with you. So a, a couple of um, Tips on on creating petitions. Um, one is to is to keep it simple. Uh, re realizing that people often aren't interested in in reading uh, you know five pages of, of text um, with footnotes, and so as much as possible. And we just had our communications webinar, and I think we touched on some of these similar topics. Um, really kind of honing your message and distilling it down to its uh, its uh, basic elements. Um, and uh, having that serve as the basis of your petition message. We'll talk a bit more about that in a, in a minute. Um, and then make sure that, you know, as I mentioned, not petitions are a good way to show uh, decision makers and apply pressure. So, you know, having the number of names that signed on and support is important, but it's also a great organizing tool. So you want to make sure when um, you ask people to sign a petition that you capture their contact information, phone number, email address, um, so you can follow up with them and keep them informed about your campaign or invite them to take action in different ways. Um, and then it's important to, don't don't forget, <laughs> uh, if you go through the trouble of, you know, getting a lot of people to sign your petition, um, making sure that it, is, it gets in the hands of, um, of your target, whoever that might be. Um, and oftentimes this can be a great way you can turn delivery of a petition into kind of a moment in your campaign. Um, you know, you've seen, I'm sure many people have seen, particularly for larger, you know, maybe national petitions, uh, advocates or activists, you know, wheeling boxes and boxes of signatures to Capitol Hill and, and you know, making a, a little bit of theater out of, um, out of delivery of the, Signatures, uh, obviously, you know, depending on the issue, you might not be dealing with box, boxes full of signatures, and that's okay. Um, but even just kind of, you know, making sure you're documenting uh, the delivery of signatures and snapping a photo um, of, you know, one of your campaign members, um, you know, dropping off the envelope of, of signatures and sharing that out with your campaign supporters is could be a great... Um, a great milestone, and it helps keep people engaged and show that there's actual work happening in the campaign. So um, if you have questions about how to be creative with delivering signatures, we can love to talk to you about that. Um, so, you know, engaging your, your target, uh, oftentimes uh, elected officials or public staff are very busy people. Um, sometimes there's not, and sometimes you, you might know them personally, and you can talk to them for hours, and that's great. Uh, but in the case that they are very busy people, it's good to be prepared um, before you engage uh, your target. So whether you're whether you're writing them, whether you're giving them a call, you're sending them an email, um, or meeting them face to face, it's good to spend some time developing what we call you know an elevator pitch. What's the 30 second spiel on what your campaign is all about, and what are you asking them to do? Um, so you know you want to, you want to be able to t tell your story, talk about your campaign, and most importantly, um, and I've seen it happen where you know you can go through an entire meeting 
with an elected official and you forget to ask them to do anything and that's not a good <laughs> a good place to be it's not a good feeling um particularly if you're uh if you're the one leading the meeting to to realize that you know you, you spent 30 minutes you put all this work together to meet with an elected official and then you didn't ask him to support the piece of legislation or what have you that you're you're trying to organize around so make sure that you know specifically what you're asking them to do and and, and when I say specific, I mean specific, like, you know, vote this way on this bill or allocate this money in your power to pay for this specific type of plan. Um, you know, uh, tell us, you know, how long we can expect before the Public Works Department is going to fill this pothole. Um, so really try and nail down what, what that ask is is important. And then, you know, work with your campaign supporters to get that that message to your target uh, in a myriad of ways, writing, calling, emailing, um, you know, depending on who you're trying to reach, um, all three of them are uh, effective. Um, other other folks might have a, have a preference. So again, kind of understanding who your target is and the way they interact with their constituents is um, an important part of this process as well. Um, you know, but really the, the most powerful at the end of the day, you know, where our, our democracy really, um, really, uh, really shines is that direct interaction between constituents and their elected officials. And uh, here are some photos of, of folks from Active Trans meeting recently with members of Congress at the National Bike Summit that just took, took place a few few weeks ago. So there's Maggie with uh, Danny Davis and Dan, Dan Lipinski, who's, who lives to serve another day after the, the primary yesterday. Um, so, you know, arranging a face-to-face -face meeting is really the ultimate in terms of bang for your buck with, with advocacy tactics and engaging your target. That face-to-face -face meeting is uh, really something that you should always try and make happen. Um, petitions are great. Calls and emails are all, all, all very effective. But um, you know what we've heard and what kind of studies and people who kind of study advocacy for a living have shown is that these face-to-face -face meetings with constituents are you know where you can really kind of shift uh, people's thinking um, more so than in other ways um, that are often you know sending letters or getting a number of phone calls are a good way to kind of show the temperature and the number of people that support. But having a, a chance to really interact directly with an elected official is um, really important. So some tips around uh, meeting with elected officials, you know, preparation is key here. Um, if you're going with a group of people, you want to really have, have it clear in advance who's going to talk about what. Um, again, you should have your specific action absolutely nailed down. Who is the person who will actually say the magic words is something that you should identify before you walk into the room. Um, if Again, if you have multiple people uh, meeting with the elected official, you want to make sure you have um, – uh, a few minutes and people have kind of prepared and understand what part of the agenda they're going to lead. Um, it's not fun to have, not have a plan to get in there and then one person dominates the whole conversation and then the person who might have the most powerful story is left out of, out of the discussion. So making sure that you meet, you know, and spend some time in advance preparing. Um, you know, as I said, outlining your priorities um, and having those priorities documented in some kind of, it doesn't have to be flashy or fancy or graphic designed. It can just be a simple list of bullet points um, that you can leave behind uh, with the elected official or their staff person that clearly outlines, just like your petition, or maybe it is your petition, um, what your what the problem is, what the solution you're asking for is, and, and what action you're asking them to take in support of that. Uh, is, is really critical. Another thing, um, a, a piece of advice, uh, is don't make stuff up <laughs> in meetings. <laughs> um, if you, uh, if you are, are seen as an unreliable uh, source of information, you can really kind of poison the well with elected officials, and that can set you back um, in, in really big ways. So it's okay if you don't know the answer to a question to say, I don't know. And um, it actually provides a window to uh, establish more of a dialogue with an elected official because the right after you say, I don't know, you can say, but I can find out for you um, and who on your staff should I be in communication with about that. Um, then all of a sudden you got them on the hook for continuing to talk to you and all that follow up provides you more opportunity to continue to kind of hammer your message home. So don't be afraid if you don't know, um, you know, kind of telling your own story and and making your ask is the most important thing. If they have specific facts or figures or things that they want to know, um, 
tell them that you don't know, but you can, you're going to email Maggie at Active Trans. She's, she's going to help you find out. <laughs> um, so another way to engage elected officials is you know, a lot of times there will be um, uh, testimony uh, at, at, in different, particularly in the legislative branch um, or different commissions. Uh, so this could be either um, on a specific issue where you might be able to um, get yourself added to an agenda um, to testify, um, or a, a lot of places have public comment periods um, at the end of meetings, uh, which are great places to mobilize um, your campaign supporters around. Um, and again, this is all about preparation, so making sure you practice what are your, your two to three key points. Um, and you know your your the message in your petition should be the same as your elevator speech should be the same as what you're putting in your fact sheet to your legislator should be the same as the words that you're gonna say during your testimony. So making sure that you know those key points are kind of threaded throughout all your different engagement tactics. Um, you know, bring other people along. Um, a lot of times people might know you as like, oh, that's the dude who's working on the bike lane, but they didn't know that like. Nancy, the cafe owner, also wants a bike lane, and sometimes her voice can be more powerful and resonate more um, because it's unexpected. We could call those kind of un unexpected messengers. Um, and you know, again, provide handouts, so not just relying on people um, remembering what you have to say, but giving them physical documentation of what your asks are. Um, finally, uh, some petition writing tips, um, and if people have questions about this, or, you know, we're always happy to look at stuff that you come up with, and, and so use this as a resource with this. Um, uh, you know, you want to, again, kind of have a clear goal, um, keep it brief, realize that people are more likely to read shorter content, um, always have a, a polite uh, a polite tone. Um, you can be direct um, without, and you can, you know, even be confrontational without being mean or nasty. And again, this gets back to the importance of kind of maintaining credibility um, with uh, with decision makers. And if you're just a person who's throwing bombs, um, well, guess what? You're never going to get into the to the room to be able to to persuade that person or get what you want done. Um, make sure you read it over after you revise it. You know, like any kind of proofreading, always always good to make sure that uh, as change happens, um, you're reading through stuff. Um, one kind of structure that, that we use, not just for petition writing, but for a lot of our advocacy writing in general, is this problem, solution, action structure. Um, so with a petition in particular, um, you're having a title that includes your call to action. So it, people should be able to read the title and, and have a basic understanding of what the petition is asking for. So petition to support bike lanes on Main Street, not some, you know, kind of vague thing um, or, you know, Build awareness to make walking better. Um, you want to you want people to be able to take away just from the title, kind of what you're getting at, um, and then they're structuring kind of the body of your petition around this kind of three three step um, recipe. Which again, we use this in our blogs, in our petitions, in our fact sheets. Um, it, it really is. Um, I, th I think a really great way to think about how to communicate advocacy issues. So what what's the problem you're trying to address? Have some kind of simple problem definition. Um, what is the solution you're proposing, right? So the problem is it's dangerous to bike on Main Street. The solution is put a bike lane on, on Main Street. And then what action can your audience do? So um, for a grassroots uh, audience, it's, it's, you know, sign this petition, lend your voice and your name to our, our campaign. Um, but you know, we're also we're asking you know Joe Blow on the uh, at the Public Works Department to you know develop a, a project to put a bike lane on Main Street. Um, that should all be kind of laid out. But this problem solution action, you could even have those as like headers in your in your petition and make it really easy for people to to understand specifically what you're what you're trying to ask. Um, and then, yeah, there are a lot of different ways to get petitions out. Um, we have some online tools um, that you can take advantage of, so we can always help uh, use our system to to put your petition online and to send it out to our members and supporters. So please use this as a resource. But there are also a lot of free online petition sites. I'm sure people have seen a lot of these, change.org, um, all the way to to uh, Facebook. Lots of different ways to um, 
get your petition online and, and realize that you can, you know, I think having multiple um, ways for people to sign your petition is always a good idea. So having a hard copy version that you can take to the farmer's market, but also that online version that can, can make the way around, around the web is great. So now we're going to um, hand it over to... Yeah, to um, Greg Glover. Uh, he is from the McHenry County Bicycle Advocates. And I'm going to try to unmute him right now, so bear with us um, if this takes a moment. Oh, let's see. And I cannot unmute him. Okay, so what I am going to do is... Oh, How about oh, now? Can you hear me? Yes, Greg, yes. Hey. Hi. Okay. So um, Greg is going to tell us about... Uh, a peti petition he created and the impact it had on the community. So I'll, I'll let you take it from here. Great, thank you. So uh, I'll try and keep this uh, short and sweet here. Th this is related to um, a gap in uh, McHenry County, just south of the city of McHenry, uh, between the existing prairie pass. Many of you may know it actually stretches all the way down to Aurora, goes by different names as each segment, uh, the Fox River, et cetera, all the way up to Wisconsin, uh, connects. There is a gap be there that could connect over to the Moraine Hill State Park. Uh, and uh, that entire stretch, starting at the Prairie Path, going east all the way to, to Lake Michigan, has been designated by uh, as the Millennium Trail. So that really was, is a, and actually, I didn't even know that when I started this initiative. So there you go. Uh, but as with many of these uh, efforts, you know, it started with me, my personally, just realizing that this is uh, an unsafe uh, passage for bicyclists. You know, we need a trail. So, okay, great. So in 2016, I had uh, decided I, I'd, I'd like to do something, right? So I didn't know what to do. I had met with some of the county planning people. They uh, had all expressed that this was a high priority. Great, you know, that, that was good to hear. Uh, and so then what? Well, the answer is I didn't really do anything. <laughs> it wasn't until March of 2017, February or March, I think it was, and uh, I found out through one of the county planning folks that the city of McHenry, which was the first government entity that needed to weigh in on this, had it had come up before the city council, and they decided to table the entire thing. No funding for the initial engineering had been approved. Well, I was—I felt devastated. I, I felt like I had let down the project that I had committed to move forward. I, I let down my peers on the uh, McHenry County Bicycle Advocates, uh, and it was really a kind of a turning point to decide. Well, all right, you know, is this really something I want to? Uh, do uh, work on or not. I could have easily, you know, done nothing uh, at that point because I kind of thought this is dead for now, whatever. So I kind of decided, all right, what can I do? I knew that part of the gap was going to include crossing the Union Pacific Railroad tracks, which is a big deal to get approval from the railroad. Ultimately, it's probably the, the, the toughest thing. So I thought, all right, we, I know we're going to need community support to ultimately to convince the railroad, even if all the other funding agencies, uh, you know, have approved this thing. So I went out on the trail, made up my little forms, and started to approach people. And uh, that was not easy for me. I. You know, the first people I went up to, I, I said, you know, oh, can I ask you a question? It was like, no, that is not the right way to ask somebody to sign on. It's the, you know, you got this, oh, yeah, right, you know, win a free vacation. or what. So I realized 
I just you just go up to people and say, I'm with the McHenry County Bicycle Advocates. We're looking to get support for this uh, gap. Would you be willing to provide your name? And guess what? I, 98, 99% of the people were happy to do that. And I was really pleasantly shocked at that, I guess. And as, the more people I asked, you know, the more, more it became easier to ask them. Uh, and I'll tell you, I think it energized me as much as providing the individual signatures to keep going. Uh, that's one of my biggest messages, I think, is that, um, you know, how do you, how do you get started? Well, you, you, you just get started small, right? And just ask people for, for their support. So I realized, hey, wait, I'm only one person. I can only, you know, get so many signatures. And I joked to my wife at the beginning. I said, boy, it'd really be cool to get a thousand signatures. Ha, ha, ha. Uh, but I, I asked the bike shops in the area, you know, kind of, duh, that, that makes sense. And they said, sure. You know, so they gave them forms. Um, I asked the bicycle club. Okay. And they said, great. And I asked my colleagues on the bicycle advocates and they said absolutely uh so then we started you know capturing more signatures that way uh and and they started adding up uh, uh over time you know and i'd get stuff back in the mail and this and that but i kept it local i felt this was a local uh or let's say regional issue i didn't want to throw those on the web and uh, necessarily, although I got signatures from people on the trail standing there from people from California and Minnesota. And I thought that's really cool because it tells the local municipalities, this trail system is being used by people from all over the place. It's an economic driver. So I kept getting the individual signatures, but I also thought, you know, Speaking of economics, I bet these businesses, that would really be a cool thing to uh, add. So I started walking into all the businesses that are in and around Bull Valley Road, where it crosses uh, Route 31 and connects to the existing trail, the Marine Hills. And again, you know, you sort of gulp the first time. I mean, you're walking into this business. They could say, who the crap are you? And what, you know, why why should I support a, a bicycle path? But I was pleasantly surprised that they were very supportive. And and I, I don't think I had one business that said no. Um, I also went to Centegra Hospital, which has a large hospital branch that right off of the trail. Uh, you know, and I, it took a while. <laughs> I went up to the, you know, the administration person, the, you know, they they looked at me sideways and, but after, you know, I kept haranguing them and I actually eventually got a letter, personalized letter from the hospital saying, we support this. Um, so then I went to the McHenry Chamber of Commerce. By now I'm like rolling along. This is great. They invited me to come and speak to the chamber event, uh, and uh, I just got uh, a ton of support. So I ended up getting, long story short here, um, at the end of the process, this is over the entire summer of 2017 into the fall, we got 1,100 individual signatures. I, and I would have never thought that was possible. We also got 86 separate businesses who I personally talked to each of those business owners uh, to get, and I, we also got several customized letters of endorsement, not only from Centegra Hospital, uh, McHenry Savings Bank, we got uh, State Senator uh, Pam Altoff's office to give her a letter of support. So at the end of the day, uh, we re I presented all this to the McHenry City Council. Uh, they uh, have fully endorsed the project to proceed with phase one engineering. Um, the county, uh, who again had all, all 
already the planning groups had made this a high priority, but now the county board has also uh, has also endorsed the the, the project to, to proceed for their part of the funding. So you know this is going to be a long term deal. Uh, this isn't over. I mean, this is just phase one. And again, ultimately, the railroad is going to have to approve this. And that was always in the back of my mind that these signatures and endorsements, without that, there's no way that they're going to – there's no guarantee they will anyway. But um, that, was, that was always part of my driver. So I guess the point is, um, you know, you've got to start someplace. It was not easy for me to ask people for help. I'd never done that before. Um, it's just sort of not my nature, I guess. <laughs> but uh, I got more uh, positive and more confident the, the, the farther I kept going. So that would be, I guess, my message for others that say, oh, my gosh, I don't know where to start. I'm scared. This is overwhelming. What if I screw up and blow the whole thing? Which is all those thoughts were in my mind. Uh, is it's it's okay. Trust yourself, and and you can get something done. So that's it. Great, thank you, Greg. I I love your story, and I think it's it's uh, it, it, you can just see you were persistent, and it made a difference. Like and 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 you did something that wasn't necessarily easy, but it it paid off. So, and I, I did want to say if anyone has any questions for Greg or Jim, there there is a little, if you're actually viewing the webinar live right now uh, on your laptop or computer, there's a little comment box where you can type in a question. And I actually see someone typing in a question right now. Um, but yeah, Greg, thank you so much. Uh, Oh, and Patrick Smith says, thanks for sharing your story. Resonates with, with me, the challenge to get it done, but excited to hear your success. So it's definitely, I feel I feel motivated. I want to go start a petition and <laughs> go find some signatures. And, and I think your your thoughts about, like, how do you approach people? That's a, a good uh, tip um, to, to, to engage with both individuals and businesses. So thank you, Greg. Appreciate it. Um, so we'll um, move on to the next slide. Um, so we just wanted to share a couple uh, statistics, or sorry, a couple resources with you. Uh, on our Bike Walk Every Town page on the Active Trans website, we have some tip sheets on best practices for writing a petition, as well as some examples that you might look at to see uh, to see their format and the style. Uh, as well as a tip sheet on different outreach strategies that Jim went over today. Uh, also, there's uh, People for Bikes. Just wanted to mention this on their website. They have a lot of statistics on the benefits of uh, walking, biking, transit infrastructure uh, on, you know, economically, the economic benefits, the health benefits, and some, some of those uh, facts might be useful to you as you're trying to uh, influence your elected officials or recruit uh, supporters for for your cause. So just wanted to mention that. And for anyone that registered for this webinar, or if you're on the Bike Walk Every Town uh, advocate email list, I will be sure to send out those resources to you as well as a recording of this webinar. And if you uh, are not on our email list, you can reach out to me at maggie at activetrans.org and there, there's my email right there and Jim's email as well if you'd like to reach out to him. Uh, so yeah, if, if anyone has any questions, type them now, but of course feel free to reach out to us later. Uh, just so you have it on your radar, our next webinar is going to be on April 18th, and it's going to be about the pop-up events that Jim kind of gave you a little teaser about. Uh, so we're going to, our uh, transportation planner at Active Trans is going to discuss uh, how she, her experience organizing these events in the suburbs uh, a couple years ago, and then we're going to hear from a resident who this past fall uh, 
hosted a pop-up protected bike lane in her community. So uh, thank you all for joining us today. We appreciate it and uh, hope to see you again in April. Hey, thank you.